Okay. Hi, everybody. <laughs> uh, I would like to welcome you to the second SDB postdoctoral seminar series as people are starting to trickle in um, and provide you with the little teaser that if you stay tuned until the end, the entire list of uh, upcoming speakers will be announced. So I have the pleasure today of introducing Dewan Farmer. Uh, Dewan did his graduate work at the University of California, San Francisco in Dr. Michael McManus's lab. And as a graduate student, he studied the role of microRNAs in organogenesis and identified microRNA 205 as an essential gene for proper lacrimal gland development. For his postdoc, he went over to University of Southern California and joined Dr. Gage Crump's lab. He's currently supported by the HHMI Hannah Gray Fellows Program and the Burroughs Wellcome Trust Postdoctoral Enrichment Program. Today, you'll be hearing about his exciting work combining the unique strengths of zebrafish woohoo, and mice to understand the development of cranial sutures and their resident stem cell populations. And with that, I'm gonna pass it off to you, Dewan. Okay. Thank you so much for that introduction. I am very excited to share with you all a bit about what I am doing to understand the embryonic origins uh, and, and the genetic regulation of the stem cells that build the vertebrate skull. So as we all know, uh, the organogenesis is a, a crucial compartment of embryonic development. And we know a lot about the specification and the formation of the, of the many organs that will comprise our body at these embryonic and fetal stages. However, after the, the organs have been specified, there's this really extended period of growth and homeostasis that's required to maintain these organs throughout the life of animals. And this is facilitated by long living stem cell populations. However, despite the importance of the stem, these long living stem cells, we know very little about uh, where and where, where and how they are emerged during embryonic development as well as how the, pro the progenitor program that establishes an organ relates to the stem cell uh, um, program that maintains it over the life of an animal of any many organs. Uh, today, I'm gonna to be sharing with you all how I am taking advantage of the cranial sutures to investigate this important fundamental stem cell biology question. So what are cranial sutures? So cranial sutures are um, these fibrous joints that separate skull bones. And then importantly, during skull development, it's important that the bones remain separated to ensure the ongoing growth of the brain. And this is facilitated by the separation of these neighboring bones by suture mesenchyme that will act as a barrier uh, and ensure the separation uh, throughout uh, bone brain growth. Importantly, the suture mesenchyme also houses stem cell populations that will continually grow these populations. So to really begin to use this system to understand uh, stem cell dynamics, we first need to understand a little bit about its development. Uh, we know that, that the distinct bones that will comprise the top of the skull initiate as condensations at the edge of the head and will grow uh, from the leading edge of the bone until these bones meet. As these bones approximate, it becomes important to keep them separate, as I mentioned before, and sutures will emerge that will act as a physical barrier and a new site of growth. The relevancy and importance of these structures can be uh, exemplified in a human disorder called cranial synostosis, where these sutures can be lost, uh, either one or many, and uh, lead to the malformed skull shape and can impair brain development. This is, uh, can be exemplified by mutations in TWIST1 and TCL12 in humans, which both lead to the specific loss of the coronal suture, which separates the frontal and parietal bones. So uh, can we use this system to understand uh, this transition between progenitors and long living stem cells? Uh, the first thing we need to do to build a program to begin to interpret and uh, address this question is to first understand the cellular resolution of the coronal suture. And we wanted to first begin to understand what is the signature of the stem cell populations and mesenchymal cell types that are present after the, the suture has formed. And for example, we have chosen to focus on the coronal suture in mice uh, and because it's one of the first sutures to form. And you can see that by E15 and E17, the bones have already approximated and formed the suture. Uh, 
And so this is a recently emerged program where now growth is transitioning from an osteogenic front into a suit uh, mediated by the suture mesenchyme. And when we perform single cell RNA sequencing on these theta points, we identify a lot of different uh, clusters that represent distinct mesenchymal and osteogenic populations. Importantly, the, the, the the cell types from E15 and E17 cluster together quite nicely, suggesting that once the, the coronal suture growth program is established, it's maintained uh, for later stages. Generally, we have three different flavors of cell types that are within our data set. Uh, cells that exist above the bones, cells that are below the bones, and the cells that will help comprise the bones. And of course, we were interested in understanding the stem cell dynamics within the suture mesenchyme. And so we focused on this osteogenic population and subset of the data based on established markers of osteogenesis like RUNX2, SP7, and DLX5 and 6. And when we subset that data and perform pseudo time using Monocle, we can see this really elegant trajectory where populations of cells are initiating in this top area and basically taking two routes to become mature bones. And here you can see that the differential expression of ERG, MMP13, LEF1, and IFIDM5 can clearly differentiate these different uh, process, uh, times of uh, stages of development. If we take this and try to understand the spatial relationship, we find a consistent, uh, we find a spatial resolution that's consistent with our model. So here I'm showing you an RNA scope pro uh, analysis where I have outlined the bone, which is labeled by SP7. And you can see that ERG is highly enriched within an intervening mesenchyme, uh, consistent with the behaving as a stem cell population. Uh, and if we look at these different pre-osteoblast populations, you can see that while left wing really nicely is enriched within the tips of the growing bones, which is where they show the directional growth from the coronal suture, you can see that MMP13 kind of sits away from the suture, suggesting that there's a separate pre-osteoblast program that's established for uh, changing the width of bones versus the length, which is left one. And of course, these all converge into a similar IFIDM5 uh, osteoblast signature uh, that we can see here. So identifying this ERG population was very exciting because it was one of the first uh, ways that we can identify uh, a stem cell population or a progenitor population at these uh, embryonic stages. And so we wanted to investigate this population a bit further, and we were able to identify several other progenitor markers that are established in the skeletal uh, and other fields that are enriched within this ERG subset. And one of the genes that was enriched was 6.2, and we were able to perform double RNA scope analysis and show that indeed ERG and 6.2 really co-cluster, uh, co-label similar cells in the developing coronal suture. So the beauty of the 6-2 is that it's been used as an excellent marker for uh, progenitors in the context of the kidney. And so there's great tools available to allow us to dissect the, the role of 6-2 positive cells within the suture. And here I'm showing you some preliminary data where we have taken advantage of the 6-2 the constitutive Cree to just under ask a simple question of whether 6-2 derived cells can give rise to bone. And indeed, we can see that we can see very nice contribution of 6-2 derived cells to the frontal bone. And importantly, this is a, uh, um, this is a, a, a back. And so it doesn't, may not recapitulate the full endogenous expression, uh, but because uh, this 6-2 field is so well characterized, we can take advantage of the 6-2 uh, knock-in lines for Cre ERT2 to really ask, are 6-2 expressing cells actually progenitor cells in the context of the suture? In addition, we can take these markers that we identified to understand the dynamics of changes that happens when coronal sutures fail to form. As I mentioned before, TWIST1 and TCF12 are important for proper coronal suture formation. And in mutants, we know that TWIST1 and TCF12 double heads have, lose their suture uh, and have cranial synostosis. So what happens with 6-2 expression? So here we can see that normally 6-2 has this really interesting asymmetric pattern that has enriched above the frontal bones, extends through the suture mesenchyme, and then is enriched below the parietal bone. And this asymmetry is consistent with the morphogenesis of the suture, as we know the frontal bone is always overlaid by the parietal bone. 
And in our knockouts, what we can see is that this asymmetry, particularly above the bones, is lost. And we can see that instead of having this normal asymmetry, we can now begin to see that the bones are basically beginning to converge onto one another, a consistent pattern that we've documented before in the TWIST-1 TCF12 mutants. And so, so far, I've shown you that we have some exciting data that allows us to begin to interrogate the program that is established after suture formation. But I briefly want to tell you a bit about the osteogenic subtypes, the non-osteogenic subtypes that seem to be supporting uh, the corona suture as well. And so today I'm just going to focus on one ectocranial layer and one uh, meningeal layer uh, to show you what we found. And one exciting layer that we identified was a layer that was enriched for many markers that are involved in ligament and tendon identity, like sclerosis and MKX. In addition, we saw the expression of some markers like TAC1, which has been shown to be important from a mechanical responsiveness of a, uh, human tenocytes. And when we do RNA scope for these specific markers of this cluster, we were really interested to see that the, the expression really kind of labeled a mesenchymal subset that bridged the frontal and parietal bones. This was especially interesting because we often think of ligaments as being uh, linking uh, bones at joints, uh, car cartilaginous joints. But here we're looking at a fibrous joint and here we can also see a ligament like mesenchyme. And this is important because this might help us re rethink the way mechanotransduction and brain and bone uh, uh, growth is being coordinated. In addition to the ectocranial layers, we were, of course, interested in the meningeal layers because previous research had demonstrated that the meningeal layers are critical for maintaining suture uh, patency or openness during development. Recently, and we know generally that there's uh, three major layers of meninges, the pia matter, the arachnoid matter, and the dura matter, which can be separated into meningeal dura and periosteal dura. A recent report uh, in Dev Cell really did a, a wonderful job at uh, highlighting the heterogeneity within a meninges compartment and identified a CRAB B2 uh, marker that labeled both dura and dura matter and arachnoid layers. Interestingly, we were able to find similarly two uh, distinct CRAB B2 populations in our data set that, that sit below the corona suture. But most intriguingly, we identified a very specific set of cells that had a similar profile to dura matter that sat right above this, this CRAB B2 domain. This, this layer expressed, it, expressed many markers that were enriched within the dura matter, but it also had a very uh, a high level of a relationship with cartilage cells, including MATIN4, which is highly expressed in cartilage. This, is, this drew our attention because we know that in certain uh, sutures, uh, that the, 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 the suture can form through endochondrial ossification uh, and through stimulation of an underlying cartilage. And we know that in the context of mutants, we have many scenarios where we have atopic cartilage forming. And so this might help us understand the pathology of uh, many, many, um, many mutants, but it also might help us understand the natural process by which sutures might fuse. So what I've shown you so far is that using the mouse data set, we've been able to capture the osteogenic trajectory that happens after the suture is formed, as well as identify a period of, of ERG positive population that requires further investigation to in, an interrogation. But of course, our big question is how do these different populations relate? And so we really wanna to begin to label the cells that are really there early establishing bones and understand how they relate to the long living stem cell populations that maintain them. For that reason, we turn to the zebrafish model, which is uniquely capable of doing this, because as you know, zebrafish uh, develop outside the mother, but also given the superficial nature of the calvaria bones, we can actually image these animals throughout the life of zebrafish development. So we perform single cell analysis on a zebrafish to see how it compares to the mouse uh, corona suture. And, and we did this at a time point, of course, when we have sutures like we have in our, our mouse data set, but different from our mouse data set, we did an additional time point where you can see that the bone fronts are free and not yet formed the uh, sutures yet, allowing us to compare the signatures between these two different time points. And what we were able to identify is that uh, through validation in both uh, mouse that I, and fish that I won't be able to show you, that we can see several similar signatures, signatures of what we captured in mouse, including erg expression within the suture mesenchyme, uh, and that and so that's great because these features appear to be conserved. 
And we also noted that when we separate these different populations, that the general composition of the juvenile and adult don't seem to be drastically different, suggesting that more or less the composition of the cell types that comprise these two different developmental time points is similar. Uh, and so with that in mind, we wanted to say, can we translate the information that we've learned from the mouse and zebrafish single cell in order to do some live imaging and really an, uh, analyze the track, the path in which these progenitor populations uh, develop and mature into these uh, late stem cell populations. And of course, our favorite candidate was ERG. We noted that ERG was really only modestly expressed. And so we wanted to see if there might be other family members that are actually enriched with this ERG transcription factor. And we saw that another ETS transcription factor, FLEA1A, was also highly expressed within a suture mesenchyme or specific to the suture mesenchyme. And importantly, we have a FLEA1A GFP that has been long established in the lab uh, that labels mesenchyme as well as blood vessels. And so we asked a simple question, do we see FLEA1 GFP at bone fronts and within the suture mesenchyme? And indeed, if we look at uh, skull bones, and then the frontal bone before sutures are formed and is, uh, is still at a bone front, we can see this really rich F flea GFP positive domain of expression right ahead of the SP7 positive cells. In addition, if we look after the sutures are formed, we can similarly see that this flea one GFP expression is maintained, consistent with the idea that generally the, the programs that are uh, involved within the pro early progenitors and the late stem cells of the coronal suture might have some concerned features. So next, we really want to begin to interrogate the stem cell interactions that are, or sorry, we want to interrogate uh, how progenitors might be altered uh, during uh, skull bone development. And of course, what we really want to have is uh, lots of different Cree lines, which we're actively creating now to really interrogate this process. But at the, at the moment, I've taken advantage of a, a, another uh, line that I've created in a line, angiopoietin like 1B uh, nuclear EOS, which beautifully labels osteoblasts um, in the skull bones. And I don't have time to show you the data that supports this, but we've shown that all the cells that are related to the osteogenic fronts are SP7 positive. So what this allows us to do is take advantage of this convertible system. And what we can do is take this green, uh, this green protein and convert it so that they're all magenta equivalent and ask the question, where and when do new green cells come from? The, and there's two possibilities. One possibility is that osteoblasts are giving rise to themselves. And in that scenario, only labeled cells will be monitored after 24 hours. And another scenario is that there is a progenitor population that's giving rise to osteoblasts that is not labeled by this marker. And indeed, what we can very nicely see is that in our at the just at the 24 hours of conversion, we can see that we can see single positive uh, um, osteoblasts being um, um, emerging so, uh, at the bone fronts in particular and not at, at the more distal parts of the frontal bone, consistent with the location of that flea wing, uh, um GFP mesenchyme and suggesting that there's a mesenchymal population at bone fronts that is contributing to the growth of the brain of the bones. Importantly, if we take the zoom out view of this and we ask the same question, we can also begin to understand some interesting dynamics of uh, progenitor activity inferred from our, our angiopoietin line. And what you can hopefully appreciate is that at the stages where the bones are open, you can see that there's lots of green cell, or green only cells, suggesting that there's lots of progenitor production of osteoblasts at the bone fronts. But as, you, as the suture begins to form, what I hope you can appreciate is that while you still see lots of green area, uh, green only cells in the areas where there's still osteogenic fronts and the bones haven't overlapped, as these bones begin to overlap, you can see that there's mostly double positive cells suggesting that the, the rate of progenitor driven osteoblast uh, differenti of, of osteoblast differentiation has been uh, decreased over time. And this is consistent with reports from Shannon Fisher's lab that nicely shows that as the bones, as the sutures begin to form, the rate of growth of bone begins to slow. And so this is actually a very interesting point because it highlights the idea that even though we might see some expression patterns similar to early and late stages of development, the behavior actually could be, uh, these cells might be different. So what might be informing those differences? 
For that reason, we returned to our single cell data and we wanted to ask, even though these populations are intermingled between these time points, can we capture transcriptional differences between juvenile and adult uh, um, um, tissues? And what we noticed was that in this subset, we saw that um, the specific enrichment of a lot of different um, BMP antagonists. So NOT2, NOT3, and GRIM1 are all um, antagonists of the BMP pathway, and BMP signaling is absolutely critical for osteoblast differentiation. And so you wanted to understand this, the whether, why, and how uh, these dynamics of antagonists are being expressed across suture development. And what we found uh, is that by making another knock-in line for GRAM1A and doing repeated life imaging, we we're able to show that at these early stages where the skull oh, yeah. fat is comprised of mostly uh, stem cells, uh, sorry, uh, mostly um, uh, bone fronts, that there's largely no expression of this GRAM1A reporter. But as these bones begin to approximate, we can see particularly where the, the, uh, the the sutures are forming at the earliest stages, the activation of this GRIM-1 program, and this expands as these sutures mature. And so this is a very interesting finding because it suggests that, that the BMP antagonist might be playing an important role in slowing the progenitor differentiation that happens within the suture uh, compared to the bone fronts. And so we are actively investigating this, these, this, this shift in the context of our of, of, in genetic mutants as well. So what I've shown you so far is that we have captured a diversity of mesenchymal subtypes as well as the osteogenic trajectory within the mouse coronal suture. And then we've been able to re relay this to the zebrafish to look at live and use live imaging to look at shifting differentiation dynamics between the fronts and the uh, coronal suture, but also identify novel gene expression programs that distinguish these two stages of growth. And so, of course, there's lots more to do. And in the future, I really want to prioritize beginning to understand the, the lineage relationship between the early and late progenitor populations that grow bones, but also to understand what regulates this process and the behavior of these cell populations. And in the end, I think I really would like to eventually understand how these osteogenic progenitors are being influenced by that not osteogenic mesenchyme, such as the meningeal tissues and the echocranial tissues I discussed earlier in this talk. So with that, I would like to thank you all for listening. And I would uh, like to thank Gage Crump and Rob Maxson, who are my co-mentors for this work. Uh, Camilla Ting really began this work uh, within the zebrafish. And I've had great collaborations with many folks in the lab to push this work forward. And of course, my collaborators at the University of Oxford and within the USC. And funding, of course. Thank you. Great job, Dewan. As we're, oh, wait. All right, got, okay, now they're rolling in. All right, so first um, is really cool synthesis of different models and methods. Am I right in thinking that the zebrafish adult skull would retain a greater ability to change in size compared to a mammalian adult skull? And then were you able to gain insight into the molecular basis for this difference between the species? That's a great question. And so um, the, 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 the writer is hinting at an important concept that Growth is uh, very dynamic in a zebrafish, and so you can the animal is growing throughout its lifetime. And so we really haven't yet uh, dug deeper into that part of the biology, but we definitely think that we uh, the behavior of these stem cells are going to be different between mouse and zebrafish, and that there's going to be some lingering uh, differences that will contribute to the maintained differentiation capacity of these stem cells. But um, we haven't yet really teased that apart. Okay, you have another question from Maria Espinosa. Uh, the zebrafish stem cells involved in the formation of the sutures, are they characterized and can they be kept in vitro? Great question. So we are just entering the, the field of stem cells in the context of the zebrafish and establishing the markers. And we have not yet tried to isolate them and try to propagate them in vitro, but that would be an important thing to do, particularly look at multipotency, multipotency as well. Okay, and now next from Alyssa Long, uh, Duan, beautiful work in images. Do you have any input on whether some of these same genes are important in postnatal situations, such as after injury? Yeah, I, you know, I think I think it's a very interesting question, and um, we are certainly interested in trying to look at this, these same programs, particularly uh, being reactivated in the context of injury. And we know a little about, a bit about that in mouse. Uh, we know that the suture mesenchyme can be migrate toward an injury site. Uh, and contribute to repair. 
uh, but we don't really know in either situation the molecular control by which that happens and how that might recapitulate some of the earlier programs that we see during development. Uh, and then you have one from, uh, sorry if I mispronounced this name. Hey, Ryon Kwan, uh, have you ever surveyed erg expression in other bones, mouse or zebrafish? So not yet. And so there, there's, a, there's a paper published that showed that erg expression is expressed around joints. And so we know a little bit about that, but in that same paper, they knocked out the, the isoforms associated with that gene expression and didn't see a phenotype. And so I think there's a lot to do. And so we currently have the flea at one knockout in zebrafish, and we want to do the same for erg and this other uh, neighboring at family member to begin to tease out the mechanisms by which it's controlled. But um, my general feeling is that the suture is probably not going to be that different from many tissues. And so we might be able to see that erg is going to be a broad marker of skeletal progenitors across tissues. Great. Uh, I actually have one other question for you. Um, so a lot of these markers that you're using for mesenchyme are vascular markers. So I was wondering what the vasculature is looking and if the vasculature is leading in before Very the bones are coming in. It's totally, and that's exactly what's happening. And so there's a whole separate interesting dynamic that as the suture begins to form, it looks like it's actually recruiting vasculature into uh, the, the corona, in, into the sutures in general. And there's already a literature is already showing that there is interactions between the osteoprogenitors and the recruitment of cranial vasculature uh, by, uh, by the osteoblast, but also by the dura compartments. And so there's certainly some coupling between vessel formation and suture formation that we really don't understand. And that is different from the bone fronts when we don't really see a clear architecture uh, for the vasculature, but as the bones form, it's a very clear correlation. Cool, okay. And then you have one more question from April uh, Deloria. Uh, any ideas if these mechanisms change or break down during suture obliteration later in life, for example, in older adults? Yes, and so the quick answer is, no, I, I don't know. Uh, and we, we know in the context of cranial synostosis, uh, where you have this premature effusion, how these networks become, are, are slowly being disrupted. But the, the, the zebrafish is not a great model for trying to image the natural process of suture formation because they remain patent throughout the life of the animal. And so uh, we really probably will have to lean on the metopic suture, which is the only, the interfrontal suture is the only one that actually fuses in either one of these species. Okay, and one more question from Augusto uh, Granillo. In the case where there's no suture present, do the bones eventually fuse? And what problems does this cause for, for growth? Uh, yeah, and so, uh, so if we obliterate, so and we, and our collaborators have shown before that if you do like a DTA experiment and you get rid of the stem cells in the suture mesenchyme, that you get bone fusions. And the result is that you have these bones fused, and if the brain is still growing, you have this increased intracranial pressure. And so it kind of recapitulates the same idea that with cranial synostosis, that yes, um, the, these bones actually compensate for each other by growing in other directions. And so that's what leads to this malformed skull shape, but that also is what leads to that increased intracranial pressure that can affect brain development. Awesome. Well, we've gotten through all the questions so far, but if you have more questions for Dewan, feel free to reach out on Twitter. We're gonna force him to become more active. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try. Yeah. All right, and I'll pass this off to Mike. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. And thank you, Duan, for a fascinating talk. Uh, it is my pleasure to now introduce our next speaker, Dr. Olana Julin. Olana did her graduate work in the Department of Molecular Genetics at the University of Toronto with Dr. Chichung Hui, exploring the role of sonic hedgehog signaling in patterning the mouse embryonic limb. Since then, Olena has joined the lab of Dr. Maria Barna at Stanford University, and the Barna lab is focused on how we're on deciphering how the composition of ribosome and regulation of translation during or impact development in the mouse and in other species. Olena's recent work really highlights an unexpected role of protein synthesis that's driven by the mTOR pathway in promoting rapid wound closure and limb regeneration in the highly regenerative aquatic salamander, the axolotl. Throughout her research, Olana has been supported by postdoctoral fellowships from the Helen Hay Whitney Foundation, the, Can the Canadian Institute of Health Research, and she has a K99R00 Pathway to Independence Award 
from the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. So please join me in welcoming Olena, and I'm excited to learn how rapid remodeling of the translatome underlies wound healing and regeneration. And just a reminder throughout the talk, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box below. Please take it away, Olena. Thanks for the great introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to share my work with you today. Um, so um, as many of you know, there's a, dr a tremendous diversity of regenerative capacity across the animal kingdom. Some species like Planaria can fully regenerate their entire bodies from just a cluster of cells. Um, many species uh, of salamanders and newts can actually fully regenerate uh, spinal cords and limbs that are severed. Uh, in contrast, the vast majority of mammals have very poor regenerative capacity. And the question that's been very interesting to me for a very long time is, what determines this difference in regenerative capacity between complex vertebrate organisms? So of course, regeneration is a very old question that's been studied for decades, uh, if not centuries. And so I wanted to approach it from a new angle. Um, and that angle was translation. Now, why translation, you might ask? Well, translation is the last step in the journey from gene to protein. And so if we look directly at what's being translated, we get a very direct readout of genes involved in a given process, which may potentially reveal more than just looking at RNA itself. Uh, in fact, we know that there's extensive regulation that's happening at the level of translation, and not all of the transcripts that are present in the cell are translated at all or to the same extent. And therefore, looking at translation really offers new possibilities to learn more about a given process. And lastly, really, translation has not really been explored in the field of regeneration, and so there's a lot to learn. Another thing I wanted to add is we know from uh, studies in, in cells and in yeast that cells rely on translational remodeling to survive acute stress. So for example, when uh, oxygen levels are low or you know, nutrient levels are low, cells will inhibit global cap-dependent translation in favor of a more selective translation program in order to produce just the critical proteins that they need uh, to survive. And this is because translation is extremely energetically costly. And so we were wondering, is there uh, an analogous process that's happening in the context of acute injury which precedes a regeneration event? So do organisms remodel translation to survive and, and heal in response to injury? And so these were the questions I wanted to explore. And today I'm going to focus on three in particular. And those are what happens to translation during acute injury and wound healing in a regenerative species? Does efficient healing rely on a selective translation program? Uh, and does it result in particular proteins that we have yet to study? And lastly, is there a difference between how regenerative and non-regenerative species uh, utilize translation? And so of course, uh, to study regeneration, I needed a regeneration model. And so I established the first colony of axolotls at Stanford University with the help of um, the Randall Voss uh, lab and the Embostoma Genetics Stock Center. Uh, axolotls are a species of aquatic salamander native to Mexico City. And these animals are, have been studied for over 100 years in the laboratory because they have this incredible capacity uh, for scarless healing and regeneration of complex structures, including the limb, the spinal cord, but as, as well as many others that have been uh, assayed, including um, the heart and the brain. And so, as you can see in this, um, in this uh, illustration, axolotls can fully regenerate a functional limb without about, within about a month of injury. But what was especially striking to me as a newcomer to the field was that uh, within 24 hours of amputation, as shown in this 24-hour time lapse, an axolotl will fully scarlessly enclose a wound site. So here I'm showing you a, a limb amputation site, and you can see these cells migrating from the periphery of the wound. And by the end of 24 hours, we go from this gaping gash to a fully fully sealed smooth dome of cells. And so I really wanted to understand, uh, one thing I should highlight is that in this 24 hour window, there's no cell proliferation occurring. Um, these are existing cells that are being remodeled uh, to close the wound. And so I wanted to understand what's happening in tr to translation in this context. So I amputated axolotl limbs and harvested a piece of tissue at zero hours and at 24 hours post amputation. And I subjected this tissue to sucrose gradient fractionation. This technique allows us to separate transcripts based on their ribosome occupancy. So when we look at a typical gradient trace at zero hours post amputation, the first peak we see are ribosome free transcripts. And then we see transcripts are bound to one, two, three or more, uh, more ribosomes. Uh, transcripts are bound to one or two ribosomes called the light polysome are typically low in translation or they're very short and just require a single ribosome for efficient translation. Uh, in contrast, transcripts that are bound to three or more ribosomes are, known, are what's known as the heavy polysome. And these are typically transcripts transcripts that we consider to be highly translated. And so as you can see at zero hours, this uh, heavy polysome region is actually quite shallow, indicating that basal translation is low. Uh, 
However, we were extremely surprised to see that at 24 hours post amputation, we have this drop in the monosome and we have this emergence of multiple peaks in the heavy polysome. So this is an extremely stereotypical trace for an increase in translation. And this was extremely surprising to us because these cells are responding to a stressor the way normal cells, um, mammalian cells in culture would respond to a mitogen. So they're actually increasing translation. So from an organismal perspective, this is the equivalent of being you know, hit by a truck and then getting up to run a marathon. It's extremely energetically costly. So we were very interested in understanding where is translation happening and what are they translating? What is so important uh, to deal uh, with this injury at this time? And so uh, the first question, where, where's translation happening? Uh, we address by injecting axolotls with OP Puro. This is an alkyne analog of the drug pyromycin, which incorporates into nascent peptides and can be visualized by a click reaction. So here OP Puro and, by, uh, and nascent peptides are visualized and, um, and shown in green. And you can see at zero hours post amputation near the wound site and the skin near the wound site, basal translation is relatively low, but present. However, when we look at 24 hours post amputation, you see that there's a dramatic increase in protein synthesis in both the skin and the muscle near the wound site. Um, and we do see an increase in protein synthesis um, in other cell types at the wound site, but it is specifically, especially prominent in the skin. So this was very exciting to us. And the next question we asked is what is being translated? Um, so just to sum up, I've shown you that translation is activated upon injury and wound healing. And again, I want to emphasize, this is not due to an increase in proliferation. These are existing, trans, uh, existing cells that are changing their translation program. So the next question was, does efficient healing rely on selective translation? And what kinds of proteins are we making? And so as I said, we next wanted to look at what is being translated. So to do this, we went back to our um, sucrose gradients and we collected the fractions from the free light and heavy polysomes at both zero and 24 hours post amputation. And we subjected each set of fractions to RNA-seq. Uh, and then we, we calculated two metrics for each transcript. We calculated the change in RNA abundance between zero and 24 hours, and this is shown on the x-axis, and this is your typical RNA-seq analysis. But on the y-axis, we calculated the change in translation efficiency. And this we, in this metric, we basically expressed the change in enrichment of a given transcript in a heavy polysome versus the other two fractions. And so when we had about 8,000 transcripts in our data set that had sufficient reads for this analysis. Uh, so they had sufficient reads across all fractions and time points. And so there were two, uh, there are many interesting subsets. I wanna highlight just two. The first is genes shown in orange. These are transcripts, there's over a thousand of them. They're specifically increased in transcription at 24 hours post amputation. I'm not going to get into the details of these transcripts, just suffice it to say, there's a lot of uh, immune regulators that are present in here. And many of these have been reported in previous RNA-seq data sets. However, I do wanna highlight um, the green data set. So these are transcripts that are translationally activated at 24 hours post amputation, but they don't show a concomitant increase uh, or change in RNA uh, expression. So these are pre-existing transcripts um, that have become more associated with the ribosome in response to injury. And so we were very interested in understanding uh, what are these pre-existing mRNAs that are being translated in response to injury. And I'm gonna highlight only a handful. So uh, it was very exciting to us to see that um, four of our top, um, top 10 hits actually were uh, very well known regulators of reactive oxygen species. So all four of these genes contain uh, thyrodoxin um, domains and thyrodoxin and peroxyrodoxin in particular have been very heavily st studied as established inhibitors of, uh, of ROS. And this is exciting because uh, for those of you who uh, are more aware of uh, the field of regeneration. It's been shown in recent uh, years that in a number of regenerative species, there's actually an increase uh, in, in ROS, and this includes in the axolotl. So it was very interesting to see that we're actually seeing inhibitors being heavily translated early on in this process, suggesting that there must be a very important stringent regulation that is happening uh, with regard to ROS. And a very talented grad student in our lab, Hannah Rosenblatt, is actually studying the role of these regulators. I also want to highlight anterior gradient protein 2A, and this is also a protein that contains a thyrodoxin domain. But it will be familiar to those of you in the uh, regeneration field as the protein uh, that drives, uh, that a neural secreted protein that drives regeneration in the newt. Um, so, um, but to step back a little, we really wanted to understand what is driving this uh, translation response. And so to do this, we first conducted gene ontology enrichment analysis of these translationally activated genes. And what we were extremely surprised to see is that translation and translation associated processes were the most heavily enriched biological processes in this gene set. 
And when we take a closer look at the transcripts in these categories, we see that there were many ribosomal proteins, translation initiation factors, and tRNA ligases. This was very surprising. The translation was regulating translation, um, but it also gave us a very important clue because a lot of these transcripts in mammals are, are translationally regulated by the mTOR pathway through uh, pyrimidine containing um, domains um, such as 5-top, top-like, and PRTV motifs in their 5 from UTRs. And so, in fact, when we looked at orthologs of known mTOR-sensitive mTOR-regulated transcripts in our data set, we saw that within our data, transcripts that were translationally regulated were disproportionately enriched for mTOR-sensitive RNAs compared to transcripts that were just regulated at the level of RNA or those that, were not, that showed no change at all. So this was very exciting. And so we wanted to look at mTOR signaling more closely. Uh, as many of you know, mTOR signaling does a lot of things in cells. It's a core regulator and it's particularly important for metabolism. It integrates many extracellular signals, including uh, nutrient availability and oxygen availability to drive a kinase uh, cascade that uh, regulates many things, including cap-dependent translation. Uh, cap-dependent translation in particular is re regulated through the phosphorylation of two arms of the mTOR pathway uh, through uh, phosphorylation of, of S6 kinase and 4-ABP. Uh, now, we were able to look at what happens to mTOR in axol at axolotl limb sites by harvesting tissue at multiple time, time points from individual animals and assessing the phosphorylation state of RPS6 and 4-ABP. So here I'm showing you the total levels of these proteins. And what we can see when we look at the phosphoisophorins of these proteins is that there is a dramatic increase in phosphorylation between 2 and 24 hours of both RPS6 and 4-ABP. And this was very exciting because it was a clear indication that these animals are actively um, promoting phosphorylation and actively activating the mTOR pathway in response to injury. Um, so what does this mean? What, what is the role of mTOR in this process? So when we in injected these animals with INK128, um, which is an inhibitor of mTOR signaling, and then we assessed uh, translation and um, pathway activation, we were able to uh, efficiently inhibit pathway activity uh, and when we look at translation at 12 hours post amputation, we see that INK treated animals have very flat polysomes indicating a shutdown in translation compared to DMSO controls, which have robust translation. More importantly, when we look at the phenotypic outcome of this, 100% of untreated or DMSO treated animals have complete uh, wound closure at 24 hours post amputation after they've been exposed to INK128. In contrast, the drug treated animals. Um, a third of them show a par only partial wound closure and half of them show a complete failure of wound closure where we see this um, shard of bone sticking out at 24 hours post amputation. Importantly, even though these animals were subjected to just one dose of this drug, when we allow them to um, continue through the regeneration process, we see that in drug treated animals, even when the drug has left their system, they, they show a severe impairment in regeneration uh, later on in the process. So I've shown you that mTOR is activated within two hours of limb amputation. It's required to activate protein synthesis and an inhibition of mTOR at the time of amputation is sufficient to disrupt wound healing and regeneration. So the last question I wanna address, and this was a particularly exciting one for me is, is there a difference between how regenerative and non-regenerative species utilize translation? Okay. So uh, this was a difficult question to ask because we can't just amputate an arm in a non-regenerative species, it would be a lethal uh, injury. So we had to find something that was analogous to limb amputation in the axolotl, but was not going to be lethal to non-regenerative model organisms such as the mouse, which we're using. And so we relied on the toe clipping assay in newborn mice, which is typically used for genotyping. Um, this injury is about 1 20th the size of the axolotl limb amputation injury. However, the, the wound takes up, up to four days to fully close and uh, results in scarring and poor closure at 24 hours post amputation. Interestingly, when we look at um, the translation state of these digit tips at zero and 24 hours in these overlaid um, sucrose gradient traces, you can see that there's actually no change in translation. And in fact, there's, and there's most definitely no, not an increase the way we see in the axolotl. This is also true if we look at OP pure incorporation, there is no change. Uh, and if we look at mTOR itself, we see that although the components of the pathway are expressed, there's again, no change in mTOR signaling. And so this suggests that injury activates mTOR signaling and protein synthesis in the regenerative axolotl, but this program is not found in the non-regenerative mouse. 
And so we wanted to understand more about these species specific di differences. And uh, we wanted to know if this was due to differences in regulation of mTOR itself. Um, so uh, activation of mTOR in response to, for example, amino acids proceeds through two steps. First, the, reg uh, the, dimer, uh, the mTOR protein dimer is essentially recruited uh, to the lysosomal membrane by the regulatory complex uh, in response to the presence of amino acids or other stimuli. And at the lysosomal membrane, mTOR is able to interact with its primary activator, REB, uh, setting off the kinase cascade. And we can look at this in the axolotl. Uh, in the absence of amino acids, axolotl AL1 cells, this is a cell line derived from the axolotl regenerative blastema, show very diffuse staining of, of mTOR in the cytoplasm and very poor overlap with uh, lysosomes shown uh, here by lysotracker. In contrast, when we add amino acids to the system, we see accumulation of mTOR in these prominent puncta that overlap with the lysosome. And the dynamics and timing of this process are very, very consistent with what we see in mammalian cells, indicating that the fundamentals of mTOR regulation are actually quite conserved between the two uh, species. However, if we look at the tissue level, we see something very striking. So these are muscle um, tissue sections from mouse and axolotl limbs uh, at zero hours post amputation. And when we look at mouse cells, we see that mTOR localizes diffusely to the cytoplasm and there's a few small puncta. In contrast, in the axolotl, we see these very prominent bright green puncta of staining uh, at zero hours post amputation. And these puncta actually increase in size and number after amputation in the axolotl, but not in the mouse. So this suggested to us that uh, axolotl mTOR may be constitutively localizing to the lysosome in these animals. And this possibility and this suggests the possibility that axolotl mTOR might be actually primed for more rapid activation, which may actually enable it to respond um, to some of these uh, signals uh, during wound healing. We wanted to better understand where this difference in localization and, and regulation may come from. So we looked at the mTOR pathway uh, in both uh, uh, in axolotl and across other species. And we looked uh, to see if evolution might give us some clues. So we conducted multiple sequence analysis for all components of the mTOR pathway. And we actually found some striking differences in the sequence of mTOR itself. So all components of mTOR signaling are very highly conserved across metazoa, including mTOR itself. However, in, within axolotls and salamanders, uh, sorry, axolotl salamanders and newt species, we found that there was this very highly conserved insertion of 20 amino acids that was specific to axolotl, uh, to newts and salamanders, but no, not other amphibians or other metazoans that was flanked uh, by very highly conserved sequences. And so we were very interested in understanding what the purpose of this uh, insertion was. And so um, when, when you look at the location of this insertion uh, on the mTOR complex, so here uh, in blue, I'm showing you the mTOR dimer bound in to Reb in Burgundy, um, these insert, the region of these insertions is very close to the interface between two, mTOR di uh, between two mTOR proteins and Reb itself. And so we're currently um, collaborating with Kevin Shokat's lab at UCSF in order to perform structural analysis in order to better understand uh, the position and potential function of this insertion. But we're also very excited to understand if axolotl and salamander specific sequence changes uh, will actually affect the structure, structure and function and localization of mTOR. And we are very interested in understanding how these sequence changes might uh, influence regenerative activity and activation of mTOR signaling. So um, to just sum up, I've shown you that mTOR drives translation um, which is required for wound healing in axolotls, but not mice. I've shown you that looking at the output of translation uh, reveals new information about biological processes that is missed if we look just at conventional RNA-seq analysis. And I've shown you that evolutionary tweaking of sequences in this highly conservative pathway uh, in the axolotl may actually underlie some aspects of regeneration. So there's a lot of ongoing work that we're focused on right now, but this includes um, identifying the roles of the individually trans individual translationally activated RNAs in regeneration. Um, we are also very interested in understanding uh, how exactly the axolotl mTOR pathway is sensing um, injury. Uh, it's very interesting to us that these animals have basically repurposed the pr predominantly metabolic regulatory pathway to actually interpret an injury cue in the same way as an amino acid uh, supplementation. And we are also very, inter very interested in understanding whether we can use targeted activation of mTOR to promote healing and regeneration in mammals. And so um, 
with that, uh, I would like you to, to thank you for your attention. And I would also like to thank Maria for her support of this project, uh, my phenomenal lab and our collaborators, in particular, these four brilliant young um, students who have helped me with this project during various points, as well as my funding sources. And I'm happy to take any questions. Great job, Olena. That was really fascinating. We have a handful of questions in the Q&A. And so we'll start up at the top. Uh, Margaret Fuller asks, do the cells increase in size? Um, sorry, do you mean, so um, do the cells uh, increase in size? So axolotl cells are actually very, very large compared to mammalian cells. Um, we don't see, uh, we have not tracked and we do not see a change in cell size um, in axolotls in, in vitro, for example, in response to mTOR signaling, but that's not something we've looked at carefully. Um, there are morphological changes to cells themselves at the, upon wound closure. So as the cells migrate to close, close the wound, the cells that form um, the wound epithelium are actually um, enlarged uh, in, relative to their previous cell shape. But we don't know if that's necessarily due to mTOR activation or because of um, how they reoriented themselves to kind of spread out and close the wound. Great, thank you. And I think you answered a follow-up question in that response. Uh, Amjad Askaris asks, what is the one gene that is transcriptionally downregulated but translationally activated? That's a very good question. I have to be honest, I don't recall off the top of my head, but we do have a subset of transcripts um, that are uh, regulated in that manner. And it's something that we are very interested in following up in the long term, uh, understanding how the different kind of, um, how translation and transcription regulation is integrated uh, with different gene sets uh, and the regulation in that regard. Okay. Uh, we have another from Augusto Granillo. Super cool talk. Can you talk more about the experiment in which you washed away the mTOR inhibitor? Did the animals fail to mount a regeneration response later in time? What if you re-amputate them? Did they lose the regeneration ability? Uh, I'm so, curious to know if inhibiting mTOR during wound healing remodeled the tissue to make it non-regenerative. So that's an excellent question. And uh, the short answer to that is, is no. Uh, the animals retain regenerative potential. What happens uh, with this um, so with a single treatment, so we, we don't actually wash out the drug, we inject the animals, but we, we monitor um, the state of pathway activation by harvesting tissue from different animals and assessing uh, the status of the pathway. So we know at about 28 hours post injection, um, mTOR, uh, the inhibitory effect wears out. Um, but we also see what happens is we let these animals uh, regrow their limbs for about a month and a half. and um, wild type con or the controls regenerate fully within about 30 days, whereas the treated animals uh, show no regeneration and regression of the wound site. It actually looks worse over time until about, about two weeks post amputation. And then they actually mount a regenerative response and start to catch up. So um, they basically, the entire process is severely delayed, but it's not abolished. Um. Baswati Bhattacharya asks, very interesting work and very nice talk. I have a question. Have you seen any increase in the translation of cell motility proteins, cytoskeleton, or extracellular matrix proteins in your gene list since the cells are trying to change position, move, and fill up the wound gap? We definitely do. Um, these, however, most of these are not necessarily regulated exclusively at the level of translation, which is the gene set I focused on. A lot of the motility and um, cytoskeletal proteins uh, are regulated both transcriptionally and translationally. Uh, Wade Sudgen, Sudgen asks, very cool. Any plans to engineer this 20 amino acid insert into a mammalian mTOR? Absolutely. So I'm actually doing those experiments right now. I've CRISPRed that insert into um, uh, human embryonic kidney cells, and we are assessing uh, how this impacts mTOR function right now. Uh, Zubo New asks, does the axolotl regenerate uh, regenerates, uh, does the axolotl regenerates complete limb regeneration after removal of mTOR inhibitor? Yes. And I think yes. you answered that earlier. Gage Crump 
asks, if zebrafish lack the 20 amino acid mTOR insertion, does this mean that the fin regeneration does not involve increased translation as in the axolotl? Is this translation-driven regeneration a derived feature of salamanders? That's an excellent question. We don't know the answer to that. Uh, and at this point, we don't know whether the 20 amino acid insert is actually pertinent to the regeneration response. Um, I, I, would, um, I do believe that uh, translation may be involved in zebrafish as well, but we have not looked at that. This would be a very interesting question to address. Um, but uh, whether um, I, I would hypothesize the dynamics of uh, mTOR pathway, if they are dependent on this insertion, would be different. So the, the zebrafish pathway would uh, behave more similarly to the mammalian versus the amphibian. But that's something we have not yet explored. Uh, Enrich Lawrence asks a uh, very interesting talk. Several lineages contribute to regeneration. Is the increased translation uh, of translation genes specific to some cell types? Likewise, is mTOR localization the same across cell types? That's a great question. Um, we see that uh, near the wound site, translation is actually increased in all cell types. However, the, um, the skin seems to ha have the most pronounced uh, increase, um, and that includes all of the cell types within the skin, um, and the secretory of cell types as well as uh, the keratinocytes. Um, in terms of, um, sorry, can you repeat the second question? The second was, likewise, is mTOR localization the same across cell types? Okay, so that's a great question. So um, both in the axolotl and the mouse, there are definitely cell-cell uh, variations in terms of localization. But I think what is true is that um, generally um, all axolotl cell types tend to have um, this more punct pronounced punctate expression of axolotl at, uh, prior to amputation, whereas in mice, uh, mTOR tends to be a little bit more diffuse overall. And we don't really see these pronounced um, Punkta as much. Okay. Uh, we have another question from Sarah Hadniak. Great talk. Do you have any plans to introduce the axolotl salamander only conserved mTOR sequence to the mouse? Oh, sorry, we got that answered already. Uh, but specifically to look at increased digit regeneration by inserting the conserved sequence. I think that would be a great experiment. Okay. And hopefully, we'll get to do that. Okay. Raul Ramos asks a really interesting talk. Have you looked at other mouse models of regeneration, such as wound-induced hair neogenesis or distal tip amputation? How about highly regenerative animals, such as acomes? That's a really great question. That's actually something, uh, both of those things are actually something I've been thinking about a lot and would love to do at some point. We have a handful of other questions here. Uh, do we have time for a few more questions or do we need to make any other announcements, co-panelists? A couple more, okay. Uh, cool, more, uh, cool work from Daniel Aldea. Could you comment more about mTOR signaling in planar or and planaria regeneration? Is there, right, it is uh, 20 amino acid insertion. Is it also found in those animals? So the, I can I can say that the 20 amino acid insertion um, appears to be unique specifically to newts and salamanders, not even other amphibian species. Um, so it is not present in planaria. Um, with regard to mTOR signaling, um, I, so mTOR has is involved in not just planaria but other regenerative species, but it is usually involved and has been studied in the context of kind of the later stages of regeneration when we have a highly proliferative blastema, and we have rapid cell division, and those cells are producing, you know, many protein building blocks, and so mTOR is activated in that context. Um, the activation of mTOR at the point of injury in that very early response, where there is no um, no uh, cell proliferation, has not been studied um, in any species or noted in any species, to my knowledge, including planaria. Great. Well, thank you. I think we need to wrap up now. So there are some additional questions that hopefully you can respond to on Twitter or something later on. Reach out to the questioners. Uh, I'd like to hand things over now to Crystal to wrap up the meeting. Thank you, Elena.
Thank you both for such amazing talks. Um, they are, I'm really excited about the, the future of your research. Um, we at the SDB who have um, organized this, this postdoctoral symposium would like to thank all of you guys for attending. And we have performed um, a number of abstract assessments, read the science and have considered a diversity of organisms and research topics and um, as well as institutions. And so uh, we wanna share the uh, and congratulate the people who have been chosen to speak in this uh, inaugural postdoctoral symposium series. So if you uh, look to the, the, the slide here, we will have a lot more information coming up on Twitter and we will remind all of you to, um, to come and log in every month. We are so excited by the responses that we got. We had so much great science, it was really hard to choose. Um, but congratulations to the people who have been chosen for this uh, seminar series and we really look forward to seeing your talks next month and until next June actually. So congratulations to the people who have been chosen and to those who have um, who've applied to because it was all really great. Thank you very much.